Bless the Lord Jesus. I want to greet you in the exalted name of Jesus. Amen. Our soon coming King. Surely there's none like him and there's none to be compared to him. I want to thank you all who have come out for Bible study tonight. I pray God that as we get into the word of God, that what we're about to discuss tonight, what we're about to study, amen, will find root in somebody's heart, will, will impact somebody's life to the point where they are willing to be changed, where they're willing to be transformed, amen. Before I go into the study, let us just bow our heads as okay. I get into prayer. Great God, we thank you, God, for today. We thank you, Lord, for one more opportunity to discuss things concerning your kingdom. God, we realize, God, is nothing good that we have done. We realize, God, is nothing good that I have done. It's of your mercies, God, where we are not consumed, for your compassion fail not. They are new every morning, grace is thy faithfulness. Tonight, God, as we are about to get into your word one more time, I pray, God, that you bless every person, God, who will be willing to listen to the word tonight. Oh, God, speak your word with power and authority tonight. I pray right now, God, that you will, I will be decreased, praise God, and you will increase. I pray right now, God, that you will take full charge, control my mind, my tongue, my heart, my soul, every part of me, and let the words that I speak come from the throne room of God. Bless every person here as we give you the glory, as we give you the honor, as we give you the praise that's due to your most exalted name, the name of Jesus, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. As I said earlier, I want to greet everyone in the exalted name of Jesus. Amen. I am grateful. I'm humbled. Amen. To be in Bible study one more time. And I pray God that as we are about to get into the word, talking about still on the topic, the power of the word, but tonight we'll be looking specifically at the transformative power of the word. I pray God that somebody will learn something from the word of God tonight. Amen. Praise God. I'll go right into sharing my screen. God bless you. So tonight we'll be looking at the power of the word, specifically the transformative power of the word. It, it is very possible, brethren, for us to, you know, to be going to church for years. It's very possible for us to be coming to the house of God day in, day out. But when we realize it seems as if there seems to be no change. And, 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 and this has bothered me. Sometimes when I when I look and I see how we treat each other, when I look and I see how we operate, praise God, it, it, it makes me wonder um, what it is that is happening, why it is that we are not having that change, that, that, that transformation that is supposed to take place in our lives. And it puzzles me, praise God. Um, but tonight we're going to be looking at the fact that as a child of God, it's very important that we don't just be church goers. It's very important that we are not just people who come to church. Amen. But at the end of the day, there must be a change in our lives. There must be a change in the way we operate, in the way we speak, in the way we walk, in the way we talk. Amen. There is a possibility. Amen. Well, you know, as, as, as the Bible says, as newborn babes, we must desire the sincere milk of the word that we may grow thereby. And we understand, even from the natural, that when a child does not get the nutrients that they need, when, they're, when they don't get the, the minerals that is needed for them to grow, um, they might live, praise God, but it's very obvious, praise God, based on how they look that something is missing. There is some, there's some nourishment. They need something. Um, so in the physical, the Bible talk about getting the, 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 the milk of the word, the milk, the sincere milk from the mother, so on and so forth. But in the spiritual, we need the sincere milk of the word that we may grow thereby. Praise God. Now, over the past few weeks, and I want to specifically thank Ella Bailey, who, uh, stepped in last week and he did a topic on the walking in the word and and and, and the how the word of God how he must live according to the word of God you know um and I'm very grateful that he was able to take that slot for me last week praise God 
But for the few weeks, we have been looking at a couple topics that geared us towards the word of God. We talk about the consequence of sin. Um, that was from the first week. We looked at the consequence of sin. Uh, then we look at lessons learned from the temptations in the wilderness. Praise God. We look at the fact that Jesus was led into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Praise God. And we look at the fact that the only way he was able to overcome, amen, the enemy, the devil, was by using the word of God. So we understood from those foundation that the word of God is the primary ground upon which we stand. Everything else is sinking stand. The, 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 the word of God is what keeps us, is our moral compass, amen, in this Christian walk. Then we moved uh, understanding this concept that is the word of God as for the keep us from temptation. We moved into the power of the word. And for the past couple of weeks, we have been looking at the power of the word from different areas. We talk about an introduction to what the word of God really is about. It's power and how you, you can use the word of God to in, in every area of your life. We look at the power of God in terms of how to study the word of God. We talk about exegesis and, 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 and doing the grammatical, historical method of interpreting verses. And we must understand verses in its proper context and all of these things and how important that is. Praise God, because we understand that the enemy also wants us. He, he has no problem with us reading he just does not want us to understand because it's just understanding the word that is going to make us change. Then we look at how to uh, defend the word. And we, we, we looked at that. That was the last time I taught. We looked at different areas, archaeology and biology and chemistry. And, and the aim of that study was for us to understand that the word of God is so powerful that it captures every area of our life. It is absolute truth. Praise God. And therefore, what people thought, or people thought they came up with, no, the word of God has already established these things years ago. Amen. Talking about the life of the flesh is in the blood. Amen. I will talk about the fact that they used to do bloodletting before, but now we see where the Bible has already established that is blood that gives us life. We look at the fact that the world is has a circular form when, the, when everybody has thought it was flat. Amen. We look at all of these things. And what we were trying to do was to, to increase our faith in relation to the word of God. Amen. Um, we want us to understand that look here, you can trust wholeheartedly in the word of Almighty God. And then uh, we move into how to apply the word. And this is where Ella Bailey came in and he looked at the whole issue of um, applying the word of God to your daily walk, your daily life. And that's very important. But tonight, what we are going to be looking at is the transformative power of the word. And, and, and as I said before, this is very important because it is possible, praise God, for us to be church day in and day out. And, and I know some of us. Praise God, are sometimes wondering how is it that we're supposed to be in a setting where people are being fed by the word, but sometimes we're not seeing the transformation. What is happening? And tonight I'm here to encourage somebody in the study that look here, you need to not just be hearers of the word, but you need to ensure that the word of God takes some serious root in your heart to the point where it guides your every aspect of life. It guides the way we talk. It guides the way we talk and, and walk, the way we, we view things. Amen. Everything in our lives, the whole man should be guided according to the word of God. Our key verses tonight is from Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. It says, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Let me say it again. For the word of God is quick and it's powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder praise God, of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Another verse we'll be looking at is Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. It says, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good 
an acceptable and perfect will of God. So be not conformed, but be transformed. Amen. I want somebody to understand that tonight, as I said earlier, we'll be looking about looking at the transformative power of the word of God. Now, as we think about the word of God, amen, I want us to understand that the verse that we read last in Romans chapter 12, uh, the word transform there comes from a Greek word, metamorpho. Amen. This is where we get the word metamorphosis from. Amen. And the word actually means to change form. It means to transfigure. It means to transform. And it, it, it's a powerful word because it implies a profound change that goes beyond mere outward appearance. It is possible for us to, to dress the part, but our hearts is not where it should be. It indicates a deep inward change. Amen. And, and, and what, why that is important for us is because we want us to reach a place where we don't only be apostolics in dress. And the fact that we wear the natural care and the fact that we don't do certain things or whatever we do as apostolics. Amen. But what I want us to understand is that the transformation that we are, that's supposed to take place supposed to be so deep inside that it only what is only left is reflected on the outside. It is possible, brothers and sisters, for us to have the outward look, but our inside is full of dead men bones. And Jesus said this of the Pharisees a couple of times, but I can tell you it is impossible for you to have it right on the inside and it's not reflected on the outside. Let me say that again. It is possible for you to have the outward look, but the inside is dirty. The inside is marred. The inside is, is full of dead men bones. It's possible to have that, but it is not possible for you to have, praise God, the inside changed and it's not reflected on the outside. As I said earlier, you, you I, I, I often wonder how it is that it is that we come to church every single Sunday and, and, and persons leave the same way every Sunday. And, and, and I realize what is happening is that the word of God is not taking root. And there are many examples in scripture that indicates the fact that you can be a part of, and I put a part in quotes, of the church. But at the same time, you are not in the church triumphant. But I it. You can, be a, you can be a member of the assembly. But at the same time, when God checks your record, as Bishop would put it, your name is not there. And one of the good examples of that is found up in relation to the church of Laodicea. And we're talking about the, 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 the transforming power of the world. But let's just look at some things to build our point. Why we should be transformed in our lives. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 3, and verse 14 to 22, and I'll read the verse. It says, and unto the angel of the church of Laodicea write, these things say the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. He said, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. Said, so then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich. And increase with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. Look at the adjectives that God used. From one perspective, the person who is not transformed, praise God, have the tendency to think that they are something. They think that they are rich and I'm coming to church and I'm doing this. But in but it's not really from your perspective is how God sees you. When God looked at the church of Laodicea, he says, uh, you say you have need of nothing, but I know, Jesus saying, that you are wretched. He said you are miserable, you are poor, you are blind and you are naked. He said I counsel thee to buy me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salves, that thou mayest see. 
As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. And this is the part that strikes me. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcome will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I have overcame and am sat down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit say to the church. I bring up the church of Laodicea as my starting point for a need for transformation. Because here it is that Jesus is describing a set of people that obviously have been going to church very often. Uh, they, they are the church of Laodicea. But there are a couple of things that Jesus said. Jesus spoke about the fact that they were neither hot nor cold. Now let me clear this one up clearly so that we don't have any more misunderstanding of that verse in relation to how we interpret it in church. To get the understanding, we need to understand that where Laodicea was located, there were two neighboring cities. There was the city of Heropolis, and there was the city, praise God, of Colossae. So these were neighboring cities to the church of Laodicea. Now, what were these cities known for? Praise God. You realize that the, in Heropolis, it was known for the fact that it had very hot springs. It had waters that was beneficial for its healing properties. It was warm. It had the minerals. It had the things that, that would make it uh, rich water. Amen. It's not like, oh, we got our mineral springs and we would tend to, to, to lie in there and it gives us nutrients somewhat to the body. That was like, that was that Heropolis was like. It, it was known for this, this type of um, therapeutic type of relaxing uh, hot water. But Colossae the other city was in the opposite of Heropolis in the sense that it was known not for hot water, but for very cold water. The water was very cold, but it was pure and it was refreshing. It, had a, it, it was like mountain spring water. It was cool and refreshing. Now here it is that Laodicea uh, was located close to this neighboring city. One city that had hot water that, that had uh, beneficial healing properties, and the other city, Colossae, that had cool spring water. Now, what usually happened, they used to use an aqueduct, and they would, and, and, and it was the primary source of bringing the water into Laodicea. Actually, Laodicea never really had any water source. So what they had to do was bring the water through uh, a system into the city of Laodicea. Now, the place that they brought the water from was Heropolis. And Heropolis, if you look at the map, was about six miles away from Laodicea. Praise God. Now, here it is that God was saying to Laodicea, that look here, I wish that you were hot or cold, but you are lukewarm. Now, what, how, how did it become lukewarm? As the water traveled from uh, Heropolis to Laodicea, the, 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 the water... Because it was hot originally, by the time it traveled that six miles into Laodicea, the water had become lukewarm. It was not just lukewarm, but it was insipid. It became, it, it, it had a taste that, that would make people feel sick. So when Jesus addressed the church of Laodicea and tell them that I wish that you were hot or cold, uh, he was not saying that I wish that you were hot as in on fire for God and cold that you're backslidden. But he was saying that I wish that you were hot, which means that you, you provide some form of uh, therapeutic, uh, some form of relaxation, some type of beneficial healing properties, or that you were cool and refreshing to me. But in my eyes, you are neither of the two. What you have become is insipid. You have become lukewarm. You, you, you don't taste good. And therefore, at the end of the day, I feel like uh, spewing you out of my mouth. So I clear that one up. So people don't have to say hot and cold, meaning hot, meaning you're on fire for God, and cold, meaning you're not on fire for God. That's not what it means. Because Jesus would never want you to be cold in the sense of being away from him. So that's the primary interpretation. But the point I want to bring out is how the fact that here is a church 
that the Bible said that Jesus stood at the door and he knocked. It tells me that it is possible that they were having church. It is possible that they were doing everything that was ritualistic. They would have a starter. They probably had a moderator. They probably had musicians. They had a good choir. Probably they had a good preacher, whatever they had. But at the end of the day, Jesus was saying, me, Jesus, is standing at the door and I am knocking. What am I saying, brethren? It is possible for us to come to church every single Sunday, but God is really not in our lives. And how we know that God is not in our lives is because he's standing on the heart door, the heart door and saying, let me in. There is no transformation taking place. There's no change. There's no reflecting of me. Amen. When I look in your life, you should be like a mirror. And, and, and as you continue to clean down the mirror, then you're beginning to see more and more of Jesus. But when I look at you, I'm, it's like I'm looking at a wall. Amen. There's no reflection. There is nothing that mirrors me. And God is saying, look here, there must be a transformation in your life. I said before, the word transformation means a deep change, a change that is not just on the outside, but a change that takes place on the inside. Praise God. So it is possible, brethren, and we don't want to be like the church of Laodicea. And what you need to understand, if, if you're going to look at it from, from a point of view of prophecy or eschatology, which is the, the study of the last things, you will realize, brothers and sisters, that the two churches according to some uh according to persons who interpret the seven churches in relation to history, they would say that the last two churches, which is Philadelphia and Laodicea is a representation of the end time church. What am I saying, brethren, is that there must be some transformation in our lives, uh, which means that we are like the church of Philadelphia. We are waiting uh, for the trump of God to sound. We are waiting for God to come in and to take us out. Or we are like the church of Laodicea, where we need a hot or cold. We are lukewarm and we're just fooling ourselves. We're thinking we are something, but we are blind and we are poor. Amen. And we, are, we have nothing that God would want to invest in because we think that we are something. And the worst thing you can do praise God is to think that you are something in the eyes of God you, you you have to realize that you must decrease and he must increase he must take full control of your life amen it was Ella Smith who ministered one Sunday morning and he was saying that a lot of us will say that we have the Holy Ghost but does the Holy Ghost have us praise God and every now and then when I remember those words I, I, I stop and I search myself it's the case where I'm just bragging that I got the Holy Ghost amen a couple of years ago 28 years ago, praise God. Or can I say that the Holy Ghost is still having me, amen, after 28 years, amen. So there must be a transformation. There must be a change in our lives, amen. Now, how is this transformation done, amen? And it goes back to the scripture that we read in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, where the writer of the book of Hebrews uses what we call a metaphorical language. He compared the word of God to something that they were very familiar with in that time. He compared it with the two-edged sword or the double-edged sword. Amen. And this comparison, brothers and sisters, was very significant in understanding the purpose or the power that the transformation will, will do in our lives when the word of God is pierced, when the word of God is in our lives. So, to get an understanding, we need to understand that the ancient time, a double-edged sword, praise God, was, was one of the most formidable weapons available. And why this is so? Because it could cut in both directions. Amen. It was exceptionally effective in battle. When you see a person coming with a double-edged sword or a two-edged sword, according to KJV, you realize that people would actually scatter because of how it was. It was able to not just cut from one angle like most swords were during that time but this sword whenever it goes in it is cutting on two sides amen and this this this, this symbolizes the thoroughness and the penetrating nature of god's word in our lives it's a double-edged sword it can penetrate and can divide with precision and you know when somebody is in the word, you know when somebody is 
in the book because there seems to be a penetration in their hearts. There seems to be a dividing of something in their lives. Amen. It's the word of God that pierced through to your innermost being. It discerns your thoughts. It discerns your intentions. It looks at your motives for what you're doing. Amen. And therefore, it was very important that they, they understood and, and, and the, the analogy or the example that was used of the two edges so it was very effective in us understanding that there must be a transformation that takes place when the word of God penetrates our lives. So I would say transformation is done through the word of God, which is quick, which means alive. So the word of God is quick and it is powerful, which means it's active. Amen. When you get into the book, when you get into the word, amen, it's a powerful thing. It, 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 the word of God, which is the subject and the predicate, means it's alive and it's active in our life. It transforms us when we get into the book. Praise God. Now, there are a couple of verbs that are used, and two specifically in relation to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. The first verb that is used is the word pierce. The second verb that is used is the word discern. And I want us to realize these things. When you get into the word of God, you can't get into the book and it's not changing some things. Notice the verb is pierce. And what does it pierce? And what does it penetrate? And what does it divide? It divides soul and spirit. And we're going to look at that because when it gets into the word of God, it transforms you so much that there is a dividing of the soul and the spirit. What does, what, what did they understand from this? But not only that it divides or it pierces, but it discerns the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So here it is that the, the verb that is used is that it pierces you. It discerns you. Praise God. It divides the soul and the spirit and it discerns the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Amen. When you talk about piercing, it means to run into or through as a pointed weapon does. It means to stab. It means to enter the thoughts into sharply or painfully. And can I tell you something, brethren? You know, praise God, when the word of God is working on your life, because sometimes it comes with some pain. It comes with some facts that you have to give up some things. You have to, you have to give up your right sometimes, praise God, so that peace can be involved. You have to, you have to step back sometimes because the word of God is doing something in your life. It is, it is, it is a allowing some change is doing an operating work operation if it's got on your lives that's the word of god no in order to understand why the writer of the book of hebrews said that the two-edged sword uh divides the soul and the spirit we have to get into the, the on the jewish anthropology understanding of, of and we talk about anthropology it's a really the study of man how they look at man so the, in, in Jewish anthropology, humans are often seen as what we call a tripartite being, meaning that they have a body, a soul, and a spirit. I was that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, I think it is, where Paul was talking about that, that your whole body and soul and spirit be from blameless. And he was talking about, talking about that because that's their understanding of the Jewish whole man. Now, it goes deeper because here it is that the sword, the double-edged sword, it divides, it pierces between the soul and the spirit. What does that mean? The soul to the Jewish man, it comes from a Greek word, psyche, and it's actually associated with your emotions and your desires and your individual personality. Amen. And then you have the spirit, which is the pneuma, which is associated with breath and intellect and a connection to God. So what am I saying is that the word of God does a separation between what you think, how you feel, how you steer. Amen. And it brings into perspective, separate that from, praise God, what really God wants us to do. You ever hear people say, boy, we can just, we just have to do this because of some mistake. That's a problem. It means that the word of God is not having the effect because what the word of God does, it separates your desires. It separates your individual personality, what you think and what you, what you think goes on the back burner and what God says goes on the forefront. Amen. It allows us to realize that it's not about me anymore. It's not about me being emotional. Amen. And that is why when a lot of people, they operate out of emotions. Amen. They operate out of their own 
personality. And they're saying that at the end of the day, they find it okay to continue in such a line. But when you get into the transformation power of the word, you're going to realize that it separates your psyche from your pneuma. It separates your emotions and your desires and your individual personality, who you think you are. Amen. At the end of the day, sometimes you have to take the back burner. Me, the person, I have to take that and allow God, praise God, the things of God to rise in my life. I find it easier when the sword does its operation from how, how I think it should go. Amen. And allow God's way to, to take full control. How I feel this thing should happen. Praise God. And I allow God to take full control. The word of God separates the emotions and my desires and my personality, me, from my the intellect and my connection to God. That's the word of God. Then he goes on to say, it discerns, praise God, the joints and the marrows. And again, it goes back to, 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 to all of these things. The joints are essential for movement and actions. Amen. And the marrow represents the innermost parts of the bone, crucial for life and health. Actually, see where it produces the blood and all that type of thing. So here it is that the word of God, it separates the soul and the spirit, but it discerns, praise God, the joints and the marrow. What was it doing? It's now looking into your most hidden aspect of who you are. Amen. It, 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 it is judging. It is giving insight, a sorrow, a penetrating look, a discerning look into the true me. And therefore, it, it, at the, when it gets into the word of God, it begins to, to look and to discern the movements and the actions. Why do I do that? Why do I want to start? Why do I want to teach Bible study? Why do I want to, why do I want to preach? Why do I want to moderate? Praise God. It discerns that. Why do I want to be in charge? It, it, it discerns my movements and my actions. It goes into the individual, the core of the individual and discerns the word of God is like a big mirror. It shows me me. And I realize that, look here, mm, my motive for doing that, the people might be blessed, but at the end of the day, God is upset because my motive for doing it was wrong. The reason why I did this is because I want to be seen. The word of God does that. It, it, it separates my emotions, the, my personality, uh, praise God, my who I am and, and puts me in alignment with God. But not only that, it discerns my movements and my actions and it looks at me and it says, look, why are you doing that? It goes into the innermost parts of me, just like how the marrow is the innermost part of the board, crucial for life and death, praise God, life and health, I should say, in a similar way, praise God, you're going to realize that the word of God is crucial when it looks into the innermost part of the man, the hidden aspect of the person. And, and, that, and it shows us the, through the word of God, God has the ability to reach those deep parts, those hidden parts. Amen. He's able to judge and give insight and look deep. Amen. And that's what the word of God does. That is why when you get into the book, not just on a level of study, but on a level of devotion, when you start to read the word of God and you start to, to meditate, as the Bible says in the, in the book of Judges or Joshua, this book shall not depart of them, um, shall, thou shall meditate during day and night. I think it's Joshua chapter 1 verse 8. When you get into the word of God, it's hard to, 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 to judge you and you start to, to meditate on it. And you start to get into it and you start to reflect on your life. It makes it easier for me to walk up to a brethren, if you had wronged them and to say, I was wrong, praise God, and forgive me, praise God. It brings you to a point where you realize that it, it searches me because none of us brothers and sisters are perfect, but the transformation that takes part and when we get into the book, the transformation that takes place, amen, when the word of God fools our life, it separates the emotional man from what God wants. It, 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 it discerns the giants, the, the innermost man, the, the movements, praise God, the hidden me. Help me, Lord Jesus, to be transformed. But even more so, why is this transformation so important? Why is it that as children of God, we must be transformed? It is possible, as I said earlier, to be a part of the branch but if you are not transformed, it's just a matter of time that you will not be a part of the branch. I've seen it many times where people have been in the house of God for years, for years. And then it, it seems as if one day they get up and they just leave. 
But can I tell you something, brethren? Something was taking place a long time ago. People don't get up and backslide. There was no transformation taking place. But you can only be transformed through the power of the word. So hear what Jesus said to his disciples in St. John chapter 15, verse 1 to 2 and verse 6. He said, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that bear it not fruit, he take it away. And every branch that bear it fruit, he purge it, it, that it may bring forth what? More fruit. Then he got on to verse 6. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. Now, Jesus would often use agricultural metaphors because the audience to which he was talking to was very familiar with farming practices. They, 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 they had a way of using the vineyard. It was a common thing in ancient Israel. A lot of imagery uh, is said of the vine and the branches and the pruning and it, it was very relatable, praise God, and understandable to the people who listened to Jesus. So when Jesus said to them that I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman, that agricultural familiarity, praise God, was very uh, understandable and relatable to them. Praise God. You can say that in ancient Israel, farming, amen, was not only a very common occupation, but at the end of the day, it was very vital uh, to the community's substance and, and, and their economy. Praise God. And, and this made this making of this reference to this set of people was easy for Jesus to use what they already knew to convey spiritual truths. And he did that in a relatable and a tangible manner. Praise God. So he said, I am the true vine. And my father is the husband man. Now let us try to, to dig down a little bit into this. Before each of these things, they understood. They knew the pruning practices. Uh, they understand that they, they, these things were used uh, that boost their economy. It was, they, they made the, it was the source of things like wine, amen, uh, which was practically staple in their diet. And it was actually used, praise God, for like religious ceremonies and so on and so forth. So they had to take very much care of the vineyards. They knew what these things represent. Now, with that understanding from the Jewish mind, Jesus looking at his disciples, at his audience, and saying that I am the true vine, uh, spake lowly to them. Let me tell you why. Jesus firstly identified himself as the true vine. And, 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 and I'm saying before, this was a very profound metaphor to them because they knew that Israel is often many times referred to as divine. And if Jesus is saying that I am the true vine, what Jesus was saying to them that, look, at the end of the day, I am the true source. I am the true representation of what Israel was supposed to be. That's practically what he was saying to them. Amen. Israel is often represented as a vine, but Jesus is saying to them that, look here, you are a vine, but I am the true vine. I am the true representation of what Israel should have been. Amen. It's, it's just like Jesus being the perfect man. He came to be, he's called the second Adam as a picture of what man's life should look like. In a similar way, saying that he is the true vine, he's saying that Israel, look at me. This is how you should have lived. I am the true vine. But so here it is that uh, in many times in the Old Testament, just to make the point, Israel is often referred to as a vine. Amen. And we see that, for example, in Psalm chapter 80, verse 8 to 16, and Isaiah chapter 5, verse 1 to 7. I'm just going to pick out those two little verses out of this to make the point so that we are clear that this is what the Bible teaches. So if you look at, for example, uh, Psalm chapter 80, verse 8 to 16, it said, Thou hast brought a vine out of Egypt. Thou hast cast out the heathen and planted it. Thou preparest a room before it 
and did cause it to take deep root and it filled the land. Talking about uh, the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. He took up, he brought a vine out of Egypt. Amen. And, and therefore he was talking about Israel, praise God, who he brought out of. Praise God, Egypt. I will know that from in the book of Exodus, praise God, where God brought them out of Egypt to a land that he promised them. Then Isaiah also spoke of them as being a vineyard. He said, now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved had a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And if I read going down, we talk about Israel being making wine and, and all of these times and the grief. And all, all of these verses are mentioned in Isaiah chapter 5 verse 1 to 7. I, you can read it if you want. But the point is made that Israel, praise God, was a representation of a vine. But Jesus is saying that I am the true vine. The word of God, the living word is the true vine. Now he went on to say that uh, being the true vine, I'm saying shows that he fulfills and perfect Israel, perfect what Israel was meant to be. But he went on to say that my father is the husband man. That term husband man there is another word, is not husband as in a husband but is that if you look at it in its, its greek sense it comes from where it actually means the gardener who tends to the vine so he was saying that jesus is the true vine and the father is the gardener who tends to the vine amen so god is depicted as the the gardener who whose active role in the growth and the health of his people and it, it, it emphasizes the fact that God cares for us and God is diligent in how he does his thing. Because in order for a man to take care of the vine, he has to be diligent in terms of how he takes care of the vine. Because I am the true vine and my father is the husband man. But on a vine, there are branches. Praise God. And what you're going to realize is that there are two types of branches that come from the vine. There is fruitless branch. Those are branches that do not bear any fruit. Amen. I'm saying those, and, and this speaks to the people who are in Jesus. They profess to be his followers. Like we mentioned earlier about the church of Laodicea, they profess to be people of God. But guess what? They do not produce the evidence of a transformed life. In other words, they do not produce the fruit of a transformed life. And therefore, if you are a fruitless vine, then you are removed. The second type of branch that is on the vine, praise God, is the fruitful vine. And these are the branches that bear fruit. And for those branches, those are the ones that are constantly being sanctified and refined and purged or pruned by God. Praise God. So, Every, and it went on to, to make a point. Every branch in me, which is the, which is practical where this is talking about, that bear it not fruit, he take it away. And every branch that bear it fruit, he purge it, it that it may bring forth more fruit. Now, as we are thinking about this and we are looking about the transformation of the world, where do you stand? As you come to church every Sunday, are you a fruitless vine or are you a fruitful branch? Are you a fruitless branch or are you a fruit? full branch or you are fruitless branch or you are fruitful branch the fruitless branch do not bear fruit there's no transformation in your lives amen we are not seeing love joy peace long suffering goodness temperance faith meekness kindness we're not seeing those fruit uh being manifested in the life of the person who is fruitless the fruitless branch uh, are you a fruitful branch where your life is constantly being sanctified we are seeing the growth we're not saying that you are perfect but we are seeing where god is working on your life where god is bringing you from from from, from power to power from glory to glory from levels to levels in him praise god amen and and as, as we say this we have to stop and we have to analyze ourselves because every branch in me that bear it not fruit he take it away that's what the father does Sometimes this is some people just go missing. And then when you check over a period of time, what had happened, they have been pruned. <laughs> but there are some branches that decide that I'm going to be cancer. Can I ask a question? Uh, how, do, how, how do I do this? How do I ensure that I'm a fruitful vine? Because there are consequences. You know? so if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burnt. But if you want to be a fruitful vine, then there's a term that is used in the verse, 
but every branch that abide in me. <laughs> when you abide in Jesus Christ, it implies that you have, you have a continuous and intimate relationship with Jesus, who is the living word. If you're not abiding in God, I just see this man here is using his tools to, to cut away from what is causing a problem, praise God, in the whole source, in the, in the whole uh, structure. Every branch in me that bears that fruit, he take it away. We don't want it to mess with everything else. But the ones that are, that are fruitful, praise God, then he will prune it. And ensure that it brings forth food. But the ones that are taken away, he cast them into the fire and they are burned. Now, what can we learn from the words of Jesus Christ to his disciples? The main lesson is that just as the branches cannot survive or bear fruit apart from the vine, believers cannot thrive spiritually apart from Christ. The, the, the church of Laodicea. They thought that they were something. They thought that they were rich, but in the eyes of God, they thought they were clothed, but in the eyes of God, they were naked and they were blind and they were wretched. And, 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 and we have to stop and analyze ourselves. It's not about how you see you. It's how God sees you. Are you a fruitful branch or are you a fruitless branch? Can somebody look at you and say, there goes a child of God. Do your speech betray you? The Bible says in the book of Acts that they took note that the disciples were with God, that they were with Jesus. The reason why they noted that because there was a change, there was a transformation. When people look at you, how do you speak of your brother or your sister? How do you speak of the people around you? How do you speak of your leaders or your pastor? How do you walk and talk? Is there a transformation in terms of how you carry yourself? Are you comfortable with being exposed? Some of us, it, it, it puzzles me. When you put on your clothes and you look in the mirror, are you seeing a child of God? Or are you seeing somebody that is showing flesh? Are you so interested in looking, in looking sexy over looking modest? Because nowadays our dressing has to show every single thing. And we have to be so careful, brothers and sisters, that we our how we dress doesn't cause somebody else to sin. In our lives, in our minds, are we so transformed that we, are, we want to think like how Christ think? We want to talk like how Christ talk? Or we just want to go through the motion, come into church, be on high, get to the high from church. It's not high from the wind and, the, and the, the waves that pass through the building. Praise God. But Jesus is standing on the door outside and knock. There must be a transformation in our lives. Now tonight I want us to look at what we call the divine anatomy. The transformation through scriptures. Because what we're going to realize is that transformation has a lot to do with the entire man. As the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23 to 24, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, meaning every part of you should be sanctified. Oh God, God bless my heart. Oh God, sanctify me and change me and make me into the person you want me to be. So on our Christian journey, we're going to realize that the transformation power encompasses every aspect of our being. It takes place in our spirit and our soul and our body. There must be a complete transformation of who we are. Just like, as I said before, the word there for transformation in Romans chapter 12 uh, is, comes from a word where we get the word metamorphosis from. And it, it is similar to how the caterpillar changes to the butterfly. Now, one of the things I noticed is that not only is that you're changed from a caterpillar to a butterfly, at the end of the day, if you look at a butterfly, if you did not know that the butterfly came from the caterpillar, you, you, you just wouldn't know. You wouldn't pick that up unless if they, they had not studied the process and realized that it, what, the, what the caterpillar did, the transformation process of turning from this to that, 
it is so different and far apart that it's hard to identify yourself when you look at a, the beautiful butterfly and you look at the caterpillar and the thing where everybody wants to kill it's ugly and smoggy praise god at the end of the day there must be so much a transformation that when people look at your life, they can't believe that that girl used to be a prostitute 10 years ago, you know. But well, look at her today. You can't tell. That man was a gun man. But look at him today. You, you couldn't tell he's a man of God. That person is the liest person in the world. But look at it. He's honest in how they handle business. That There must be a transformation. And what I'm going to talk about now is the fact that the transformation... The Bible uses what we call metamorphic um, terms to, 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 that we can relate to. And when we look at it, the terms that I use compass the whole body, from your head all the way down to your foot. And we're going to look at what we call divine anatomy, transformation through scripture. We're going to look at different parts of our body that needs to be transformed as a child of God. Now, tonight we're looking at seven different areas. We're looking at the eyes. Watch your eyes, watch your eyes, what they see. We're looking at your ears. What do you spend your time listening to? We're looking at the tongue. What are the things that you say? Have you ever stopped? It was, it was God who said to Miriam and Aaron, weren't you afraid to talk against the man of God? We look at the heart. <laughs> What do your heart hold on to so much that even the word of God can't shift you? Look at your hands. Look at your feet and your mind. I leave the mind for last because truly everything really starts from there. When your mind is transformed, you're going to realize it affects what you want to look at. It affects what you want to listen to. It affects what you say. It affects all your heart reacts it re affects your hands and your feet praise god but each of these aspects should be transformed according to the word of god the word of god ah uh, if applied amen will transform the things you see and the and the things you listen to and the things you say it will transform how your hands operate and how your where your feet want to go it will transform you and we're talking about the transformative power of the word of God. Now let's start with the eyes. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 22 to 23, that the light of the body is the eyes. If therefore then I be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if then I be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? Now, here it is that the scripture is practically uh, talking and Jesus is teaching uh, what we call the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7. And he, he's teaching us in this particular section about the importance of having healthy perspectives <laughs> and how your perspective affects our entire being. One of the reasons why we have problems in relation to some things is because we allow certain things to feed into us that our perspective on matters is marred. So if you feed yourself on things that will promote a certain type of lifestyle, a certain way of dressing, a certain way of, of carrying yourself. If you feed yourself with these things on Netflix and, 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 and these movie things that are on the internet, on HBO, and I don't even know people still watch these days, then you're going to realize that after a while, it becomes norm to you. The things don't affect you anymore. It's like the conscience, which the Bible says can be seared to the point where something that used to affect you doesn't affect you anymore because your conscience has been seared. 
And the truth be told is that if you're not careful, the conscience cannot operate independently of a word. <laughs> we know from the dispensation of conscience that Cain and Abel did not get our immediate command from God, like in the dispensation of innocence, don't eat of the tree of the meat of the garden. They were living by their conscience. And all through that dispensation, man's heart has become more and more wicked, has become more and more seared. Your perspective, praise God, if you don't feed yourself with the two-edged sword, if you don't feed yourself with the word of God, if you don't feed yourself with the, the food that comes from the word, you're going to realize that your perspective on things was not going to be biblical. You're going to find it okay for certain things to happen which the word of God obviously condemns. Because your perspective is not according to the word. You're going to find it okay to think that you can walk past your brother and your sister because you think that they hurt you and you are trying to justify your reason for not talking to this brother. We're doing Christian malice because the brother hurt me and therefore I think it's okay based on that action to not talk to them. Sometimes it's even you hurt the person, but because of your justifying your perspective on the matter. But Jesus says, look here, it's very important for us to have a healthy perspective, healthy eyes in terms of how it affects and, and how having this healthy perspective uh, will affect our entire being. The light of the body is the eye, the perspective. Our eyes must be transformed. But even more so, we can go into Psalms 19, verse 18. Let's take it a little further. Where David is writing, or the Psalm is, well, it was David, Psalm 119. Where it says, open thou mine eyes, that I may behold things out of thy law. And here it is that the psalmist is praying for spiritual insight. Goes back to perspective. A spiritual insight and understanding. Asking God to open his eyes to the wonders of what is in the law. We want to transform the eyes. We want eyes that, that will look at things wholesomely. That we look at things the way God wants us to see it. And if we would take it even deeper, we can the things that we look at and we feed ourselves with, we will be very careful. We will find it comfortable to be sitting down and watching two people committing fornication on our screen. And we know what that is. Or adultery or whatever it is on our screen. We won't find it good to be looking at things that are contradictory to the word. And the reason why some of us are allowed or allow ourselves to do that is because our conscience has been seared. But guess what? There's a word, a transformative power of the word that is able to soften your conscience again. When we do not keep our eyes in check, a couple of things can happen. We can talk about loss and covetousness. Matthew chapter 5, verse 28, it says, But I say unto you, saying so much unto the moon, where Jesus was talking, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her had a committed adultery with her already in his heart. In other words, in the law, the physical act was what was considered a knowledge. But Jesus said, look here, your very eyes has a way of penetrating the very soul. And he warns against looking with loss. Praise God. 
He warns us against how we view some things. You have to be careful that how we don't scroll through social media. I will start become covicious of what is happening in other people's life. We have to be careful that not because somebody gets something new, this covicious heart comes, it's it it it, it sneaks in. I guess look, you wish a me you become you start hate the person. Or we have to be careful that we don't go on Instagram and we start look at some attractive people and we allow our thoughts to linger inappropriately about them. Watch your eyes. Watch your eyes, what they see. God, give us a transformed eyes according to your word. Help me, Holy Ghost. Then we talk about envy and jealous. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 6 says, Eat thou not the bread of him that hath an evil eye, evil perspective, not a desire thou his dainty meats. Be careful how you become envy and jealous over others. You are friends with somebody for years, and because somebody got a promotion at work or they got a promotion in the house of God, instead of congratulating them, or even if you do, you feel this this little feeling of envy that comes in you start to compare your own self uh with this other person you start to feel you start to give resentful feelings and thinking that some people have all the luck and instead of being happy for the fact that god is doing something in somebody else's life you start to avoid the person you start harboring feelings of jealousy over somebody else's where God is taking somebody and what God is doing in somebody else's life because of where God is bringing them. You start to undermine the friendship. You start feeling bitter and unhappy. But guess what happened? Be careful, as the Bible says in Proverbs 23, 6, as I just quoted, Proverbs 23 and verse 6. Eat not the bread of him that hath an evil eye. Neither desire thou his dainty meats. You don't need to be envious and jealous over anybody. The things that God is doing in your life. I need to be happy for you. And when God is doing something in somebody else's life, you need to be happy for them. And I pray God that people can be happy for each other. Instead of being envious and jealous. And wanting to kill. The eyes must be careful of having distraction and worldliness. First John chapter 2, verse 6 is for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. He says, not of the Father, but it's of the world. And John is warning against the loss of the eyes, which leads to worldliness and leads us away from the will of God. Be careful that we are not distracted. With worldly things. Amen. And, and, and can I tell you that we have to be so careful that we don't spend hours watching things and episodes and all of these things and neglecting the important things of life. We, we're not spending the quality time in the world and, and, and these things. And guess what happened? When you become so distracted, then are you not doing what you're supposed to do? As night follows day, something else is going to suffer. You have to be careful that you don't become so preoccupied with worldly entertainments because these things will distract you from your responsibility. It takes from you it removes the meaningful relationship that you should have with God. And 1 John chapter 2, 16 warns against this. We have to be careful that the world don't become so much a place that we want to, that we, that we have put our stakes so deep down. We we'll talk about pride and arrogance, Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 13. And that verse actually says, 
there is a generation all oh, lofty and their eyes and their eyelids are lifted up. And the verse practically was describing the pride and the arrogance reflected in one's eyes and which will eventually lead to downfall. I was talking with a friend quite recently and she gave me a perspective that I never thought about. She said, pride and arrogance will make you do really things that are ridiculous without you even knowing it. And as we were talking, I was reminded of the source of pride and arrogance. Because pride and arrogance said to the devil, that look here, I'm going to go up against God and win. Now, how can a finite being challenge the infinite being and win? How can a being that has limited power goes up against the all-powerful God and think that he will win? In a similar way, it clouds your judgment. You begin to look at things in a way that makes no sense, no logical sense. That's what pride does. And it goes before a fall. Praise God. So, when you start to be elevated in the house of the Lord, the higher you go, the lower you should walk. Help me, Jesus. When you start to reach a point where the opinions of others, you don't want to listen to that. Nobody, you know it all. You really listen to anybody else. Search yourself. When you think that you know better than everybody else, search yourself. Pride and arrogance make it difficult for you to collaborate effectively with your church brothers and sisters. Search yourself. When you realize that your relationship with the others around you begin to suffer, search it out. Because this is the type of pride and arrogance that is cautioned against in Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 13. That's the type of pride and arrogance that the wise man spoke about. Where it brings and it leads you eventually into a pit, to a downfall. Watch your eyes. The first and part of the body that needs to be changed. My eyes. God, search me. Give me the right perspective on things. I can only get the right perspective. I can only view things your way when I'm in the book. Help me, Lord Jesus, to be in the book. But apart from the eyes, God touched my ears. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 20, 24 says, My son... Attend to my words, incline an ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes, keep them in the midst of thine heart, for they are life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. We know that hearing is very important, because the Bible tells us in Romans 10, 17, that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And because Hearing is so important. James tells us that we must be swift to hear, but slow to speak and slow to wrath. We have to be careful that what we listen to, amen, will not cause us to reach in a state where we are, are at odds with others. Don't be swift to listen to some things. Seize my son to hear the instruction that cause to hear. From the words of knowledge. Proverbs 19, 27. Let's say it again. Seize my son to hear the instruction that cause to hear from the word of knowledge. In other words, anything that will cause you to shift from what God would have you to be. Sometimes some people will call you and assist on the phone about brother so-and-so. Ask them, have you prayed for brother so-and-so? Shut them off. Some and, and, and we have to be very careful. Timothy talk about him. So for the time will come when they will not end your sound doctrine. Even that too. We spend so much time listening to some of these people on TV. That the doctrine that we should be getting in the house of God. We don't, we, we don't want that. But we said, after their own loss, they shall heed to themselves. Teachers having what? Itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth. And shall be turned into fables. 
The Bible says in Proverbs 14, 15, that the simple believes every word, but the prudent man look it well to his going. Sometimes we have to shut off some things. We have to shut off some of these false people that think that you're so spiritual. That the Bible says, beware of these false prophets which come to you in sheep clothing, but inwardly they are raving wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? The way of the fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearken unto wise counsel is wise. We have to ensure that what we listen to brothers and sisters is important. Because the wrong message can cause a problem. And I'm going to link this to something else later on. So let me jump to something, the next point, that, that feeds the ear is the tongue. So if be careful what we say, the Bible says in Proverbs 15, 4, a wholesome tongue is a tree of life. But perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. Mm -mm. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life. But perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. What is the people go around and they have a talk, 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 and they have a way of whispers and, and, and creating this division, you know, this little, this little undercover division. Let them understand, look here, your tongue is going to be transformed. So when take what part of the church of Ephesians, church of Ephesus, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Help me, Holy Ghost. The things that you say, is it ministering grace unto people that listen to you? Or is it bringing corruption in the body? When you have done talking to that, that new convert or that saint, does it cause that brethren to hate that other brethren? Hmm. Negative reports have ne negative consequences. Be careful where you listen and be careful what you say. We see it in Numbers chapter 13 and chapter 14 where the Bible talks about those 10 spies. The Bible says in Numbers chapter 13, 31 to 34, but the men that went up with him said, but we be not able to go up against these people for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel. In chapter 13 of the book of Numbers, we see where uh, the, the, the children of Israel had, had, were now at a place called in, 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 in the Sinai Peninsula, uh, a place that is called Kadesh Barnea. Amen. And it has been about two years at this point since they had left Egypt. Amen. And God instructed Moses in Numbers chapter 13 to choose one man from each tribe to spy out the land. And the Bible said for 40 days, they traveled to the land from south to north. They observed the people in the land, the buildings, and they, 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 collecting, they collected specimens. They look at the fact that there was bountiful produced in that land. But when the 12 spies report back to Moses and the people, 10 of the men, painted a picture that land that was too formidable to conquer. And only two out of the 12 had a good word, Caleb and Joshua. They had confidence that God would lead them into battle and overcome. But because of the 10 evil words that came out of some men's mouth into the ears of the people, we see in Numbers chapter 14, that it caused rebellion and consequences. The, the negative words cause the people to lose confidence in God's ability to lead. When the people start coming and whisper, oh, Bishop Daly this, and Bishop Daly are this, or Elder this, or Minister this. Be careful because it is causing people to have negative thoughts of people. To lose confidence in who God has set above them. In this season, it caused so much rebellion that they, they returned to an old way that they used. They started to grumble and they started to rebel. They even started to form plans of, 
of returning the man which had right at the border and the brothers and sisters they were at the border to go into the promised land and at this point they started to plan to return to egypt and some of the people were even talking about stoning moses and aaron that was just by 10 men giving an evil report watch your mouth what they say about asata bahaya watch your tongue what it communicates in the ears of people because God is going to hold us accountable. A transformed tongue speaks wholesome words. And some things that we don't understand, we pray about. Instead of causing division, instead of trying to get an understanding about something, some of us speak some things and it causes a problem. Can I tell you that because of the negative words, it led to a rebellion among the Israelites. And it resulted in God condemning that entire generation. And they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years because of 10 men coming with words that would cause problems. Don't take your ears and make it be a garbage bin. Don't use your mouth and spew out rubbish into the ears of people. Because when you do that, you the, 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 the tongue spew into the ears and it affects the heart. We need a transformed heart. It was David who said, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. When you look at that word, create in me a clean heart. The word create there is the same word that was used in Genesis, whereby it says, in the beginning, God created. That's the Hebrew word, bara. And it actually means to create something out of nothing. In other words, when David looked at his heart and look at where he was, he was saying, God, don't even work on this whole heart. Just give me, just take it out and create a clean heart. With a new heart out of nowhere. Give me a brand new one. God, I want you corrupt. Created me a clean heart, bara. Farm something out of nothing. Renew a right spirit within me. Ezekiel talk about him. A new heart also will I give you. And a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh. God, whatever is in my heart that should not be there. Created me a clean heart. I wonder if that's somebody's prayer tonight. Whatever is in my heart that is causing problems and divisions and issues, that, that corrupt thing that I'm thinking, that corrupt thing that resides here, Bara, created me a clean heart. The problem is that when the heart, our heart is wicked. You know, some people say, boy, me don't know about... Make me, me, me spirit not take them. You have to be careful because you see your heart, the Bible says in Jeremiah 17, 9, is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The prophet asked. In other words, your individual heart, you might think you're going along the right path. But God, I know if, if this heart ever lead me astray, take it out and give me a new one. Sometimes you might think you're doing the right thing, but if your right thing is going contrary to the word of God, then it is wrong. That is why the Bible talk about King Saul in 1 Samuel 59. It's about Saul and the people, and the people's spirit, Agag, and the best of the sheep, and the best of the oxen, and the fatlings, and the lambs, and all that was good, and would not utterly destroy them. 1 Samuel 59. King Saul disobeyed God's command. What was God's command to King Saul? Kill all the Amalekites. Get rid of all of them. But King Saul disobeyed God. Amen. And because of his disobedience, because of his disobedience, amen, it, 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 it led him to a part where God rejected him as king. He chose his heart. His heart said, look here. God said, get rid of all the Amalekites. His heart said, no, man. This look rough. Let me not do what God say. Let me spear Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fatlings and of the lambs and all that was good. 
Let me not utterly destroy them, even though God said utterly destroy them. We have to be careful because there are consequences for disobeying God. Praise God. Praise God. Let's read a quick word of prayer. Great God, as we sit here tonight, help us, Lord, just not just be in this Bible study, because this, this is what you want for us as children of God. Transform us, Holy Ghost. Transform us, Jesus. Make us into who you want us to be. God, give us the right thing, the right perspective. God, give us the right things to listen to and help us to say the right things, Holy Ghost, so that our hearts might be inclined with you, creating me a clean heart. But somebody, when you have a clean heart, then God wants to transform our hands. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that had clean hands and a pure heart, what that lifted his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. Paul said to Timothy, writing to Timothy, he said, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. In other words, how the things that we use our hands to do. Is it giving God glory? Or is it causing problems? When you sit down and you forgot to type something, or if you send a message, or if you send a WhatsApp message, is it causing somebody else to stray? Is your hands used for murder? Because sometimes you know, we don't say it out of our mouth, but we type it. And that's effective enough. We send the message to kill the brother. Look in Genesis chapter 4, verse 8, talk about Cain and Abel. But said, Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. Why did he kill him? Just because he offered something that God accepted. It goes right back to the heart. Goes right back to, 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 to a place where it was out of tune. And because his heart was out of tune, he killed his brother. The Bible says, and when you spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Why your hands are full of blood. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 50. We're careful that our hands are not full of blood to the point where God hides his eyes from us. And God will not listen to our prayers. We need a transformed hand. We also need transformed feet going down. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Where we go, amen, is very important. We can't go anywhere, anywhere. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bring it good tidings and publish peace, that bring it good tidings of good, that publish it salvation, that saith unto Zion, thy God reigneth. In other words, where, where, where's our feet leading us? Is our feet leading us to where God would have us to go? Or we have one heart that devises wicked imagination and feet that be swift in running to mischief. And that was describing the six things that God hates. Feet that are swift in running to mischief. Some of our feet, which should be taking us in the will of God, is taking us away from God. And we saw that in Jonah chapter 1, verse 3, where it says, But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa. His feet took him away from God. And because of that, there were consequences for going contrary to where God wants you to go. You have to ensure that your walk is led by where God wants you to go. There are consequences. He was disobedient in going where God would lead him. And it led him to a great storm. It also endangered the sailor's life who he was traveling with. He was eventually thrown overboard and he was swallowed by a great fish. Why? Because his feet uh, was going away from the presence of the Lord. Where's your feet going? Where are you off to? 
God help us to be transformed. We must have a transformed mind. And all of this have to do with the word, you know, is the word of God. This is quick and powerful that will cause a transformation in those elements that we spoke about. It goes back to the verse that we read, Romans 12, 2, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Romans 12, verse 2. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are honest, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, Whatever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, what should we do? Think on these things. What are we thinking on? Things that are true, things that are genuine, things that are that that are that speaks in relation to the character of God, found in God's word. Amen. We don't listen to lies and the deceptions and falls that comes in this world. If it goes contrary to the word of God, God said, God say, man must be with woman, man must be with woman. Amen. Man must not be with man, woman must not be with woman. Amen. If God made you a man, you're a man. If God made you a woman, you're a woman. We're not listening to falseness and deceptions and all of these things. We're listening to what the word of God has to say. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, refer to being honorable, fear, having integrity, amen, means that we think about things that are notable and respectable and upright, amen. Uh, we have to ensure that, amen, that we are honest in terms of our thinking. Whatsoever things are just, amen, just means that they are righteous and they are fair. Amen. In our thoughts, consider a way that are more right and, and, and equitable. We have to look at these things to ensure that our thoughts are in align with that. What's our things, praise God, are pure, which means that they are clean, they're unblemished, they are free from corruption. Amen. We're not watching certain things that will corrupt us. Amen. What's our things are lovely, which speaks about love. Um, and it talks about um expressing. Uh, inspire us to love and to admire the things of God. Whatever things are lovely. Amen. Whatever things are of good report. Sometimes we have to be careful that what the good report is that, that are things that are commendable, things that are reputable, things that are all spoken of and praiseworthy. These are the things that we think about. If there be any virtue and if there be any praise, the Bible says we should think on these things. I pray God that tonight that we have learned something in relation to the word of God. And I pray God that tonight that, you know, the things that we should think on, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are honest, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are good report. If there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Tonight, I want us to understand that the word of God should transform our entire being. Starts with the mind, which is where I ended, because the mind controls everything else. It's the, it's the headquarter for the thing that you want to look at, the thing that you want to listen to, the thing that you want to say. Praise God. It's the headquarter for all of these things. And if there be any virtue and any praise, let us think on these things. Let us bow our heads as I close out in prayer. Great God, we come before you tonight to be exalted we magnify your name one more time we thank you a lot god for the bible study tonight i pray right now god as we get into this whole aspect of trying to allow the word of god to transform us help us lord Jesus, to change in our mindset and our thoughts help us lord jesus to love you more than anything else help us lord jesus to love you more than everybody else help us lord jesus to be wanting to to serve you and to love you. I pray right now, God, in the name of Jesus, that you continue to work on our hearts, continue to transform us, and to make us who you want us to be. Oh, God, help us, Lord Jesus, that we come to the, the fullness of the statue of, the, of Christ in you. Help us, Lord Jesus, to hide our words in our hearts that we might not sin against you. Be with us as we look to you, God, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. In the most exalted name, the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you again for sticking up Bible study and continue to be in the word. God bless you. Uh, pray for the services over the weekend. I don't know if there's youth service, but pray for everything that will, con that will take part for the end of the week. Amen. God richly bless you.
in Jesus' name.